Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. We are here from New York City Council, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, building a different approach to engagement. So my name is Joyce Lee. I'm the Tech Projects and Partnerships Manager for the New York City Council, and this is Andy Cochran. I'm Andy Cochran. I'm a designer and developer for, uh, for the Digital Strategies team. Yeah. So the first thing I want to say, I know Noel is in this room, but I really, as someone who comes, who works in government, but comes from a social justice background, I just really wanted to say that this day, this conference is really special to me. This is one of the first tech spaces that I've been in where there was childcare being offered and where social justice and community engagement is a sort of central tenet. And I think that everybody in this room, folks in the front row, all of you guys have been part of the, the sea change that you know we're happy and excited to incorporate in our work. And so it really means a lot to, to be here with you guys today. So um, I just want to start off, off with some context. Thank you. <laughs> um, some context, right? So in we're the digital strategy team. Uh, we have a few other members here in our audience who are taking pictures like happy little grandparents. Um, and and we, I wanted to give a little context. And I know that the speaker, our boss, Melissa, spoke this morning and gave a sort of overview about the kinds of principles that drive our work. So a little bit of history for you guys. Um, so in May 2014, shortly after the speaker, Melissa Margarito, took office, we reformed the council's rules. Among those things um, was the call for a creation of a technology plan that would sort of outline and increase civic engagement across the city. There are other things involved in that plan, including you know, making the budget more equitable, whereas before discretionary funding was allocated based on a number of political forces, now we have a formula that calculates the levels of poverty in each district and allocate funding based on that. So later that year, in July 2014, um, we convened an internal working group on technology and digital engagement to sort of look at all the core functions of the work of the council and think about ways that we could further engage folks. At the end of the year, our team was formed, um, the digital strategy team, and then in March of the next year, we released Council 2.0, our hilariously named but awesome technology roadmap, the first one the council's ever had. Um, in July of that year, we held our first digital summit here at Civic Hall. Uh, it was really amazing, um, and it was, we sort of took a different approach that day and really convened a lot of immigrants' rights orgs, a lot of advocacy groups who we felt like don't always have the capacity or the bandwidth to work on civic technology issues or digital engagement issues um, and sort of let them hack our way into thinking about our work and rethinking the way that we engage the public. Um, so in November of 2015, we also launched Council Labs, which is an experimental site um, in which we're experimenting with new ways of communicating with the public. And as the speaker mentioned earlier, in this past December, we passed seven additional pieces of open data legislation to strengthen the law that BP Brewer has worked on for so many years um, and also bring more accountability to both the government and make the data more usable. So with that, I'll let Andy sort of take over and walk us through some Council Labs. Sure. So yeah, we're, we're building Council Labs, which is an experimental space website for us to explore new ways of sharing data and uh, information with the public. Uh, so um, in order for us to achieve like transparency and this in, like digital inclusion that we want to do, uh, there's a bit of demystification that kind of has to come first. Uh, so I want to ask you guys a few questions. Uh, I'll start with the one that the speaker asked this morning. Do you know who your council member is? If you do, raise your hand. Yeah, small group of us. Yeah. How about do you know what district, council district you live in? Okay. Um, do you know the primary functions of the city council? A few. Okay. Five people. Okay. Um, yeah. This is uh, this is this is a problem. Um, so. Uh, this is a, even a very curated crowd. You guys are all like politically engaged. You, you're aware of what's happening in your city, um, and you know we uh, we ask people on the streets uh, about this. And here's what they have to say. You know who your city council member is? Um, oh my god. Okay. Y usted sabe quién es su representante en el consejo municipal? No. I really don't. Uh, you know, we're just doing a little video just to see people know what the city council does and seeing if they know who their representative is. And do you know who the city council speaker is? I'm bad with names, oh my gosh. Um, not offhand. I, I can press on face if I see her, I recognize the face. No. No. No? 
Ah, no sé, no. Bueno, pero yo creo que yo la estoy mirando, creo que... <laughs> okay. Uh, see. But no, me, I'm okay. okay. Melissa. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna Melissa Morgan Verito. I think it's important to, as we talk about civic education and people getting more involved locally. I think it's important for people to know who their elected officials are. Uh, there's people that do know or have an idea of what the council does and who their representative is, and there are a lot that don't. And I think that that just speaks to figuring out ways that we can engage the people we represent more. Do you know what the city council does? Um, I know it, it helps uh, the community with fun. It's supposed to help regulate, like, the, oh, sorry, the laws of the area you live in. Well, we passed the laws for the city of New York. Mm -hmm. We also passed the budget with the mayor. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, district offices, like our office is right here. So we provide constituent services for the constituents if they need support and help. Um, so that's what we do. So wanted to thank you for being a part of it. Usted conoce quién es su concejal? Yo mi concejal Viverito. Ah. <laughs> Usted okay. me ha ayudado mucho. Yo he ido a su oficina. Ah, vale. Yeah. So you can see, um, you're not the only ones who don't know what it is we do. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is this is an issue. Uh, this is this is Council Labs. It's uh, this is our website that we've started with. Um, so. We really wanted to start off by demystifying exactly what it is that the council does. You know, we're all aware this is a problem. Uh, so we're trying to uh, simplify our voice. We're trying to talk to the residents of New York City as if they're our neighbor. Uh, we really want to like you know, demystify what what's going on. What is our role in New York City Council? Um, so you know, we're developing a style guide, a ways that we can talk, uh, and. Uh, we, one of our team members, our newest team member, uh, Vin Vincent Verone, uh, he is our new digital uh, content man uh, creator. Yeah, uh, so he's been working on our style guide. He made the video that you guys just watched. Um, so yeah, let's see. So one thing that we did, we worked with each of the divisions at the council, uh, the legislation division, the budget division, land use, to uh, leverage the like institutional knowledge that they have and really uh, try to explain what it is that that city council does. And you know you can you guys can go to labs and read all this information. Um, I think the great thing about the different sections on this and what we didn't start to encounter, I mean, obviously, we're a new team, right? We've been evolving in terms of both our practice and also how to work internally at the council and also externally with different partners um, on figuring out how to capture the council's work and present it in new ways. And so what Andy's talking about right here on labs is each of these sections represents us sort of massaging through a different way of capturing each department's work because we have 51 council members in New York City and we also have a large set Central staff that work on drafting legislation with council members, analyzing and creating results about the budget every single year, um, and also working around land use proposals, So, which Andy will get into more because I'm sure you've heard there's big zoning regulations um, being on the table that are being uh, legislated currently. So. Right, so yeah, recently, like as Joyce mentioned, the uh, mandatory inclusionary housing and zoning for quali uh, quality and affordability uh, was up for a public review, so uh, we held hearings on those. And uh, because of Council Labs, we had this space where we could really make uh, a level of detail in the information that we're sharing like a lot higher and a lot more uh, accessible than ever before. And thousands of people access this information, and uh, it's really great. Like, So we had people that were really uh, prepared to uh, to to give testimony at the at, at these hearings, and it's uh, you know it's really great. This is like information, like data that was never available to people before. Um, so we're hoping to do a lot more like this in the future. Um, and let's see. Well, next, I will show you districts. Yeah, the districts. So we wanted to make it really easy for everyone to find out who their council member is. Uh, so on every page, you'll see there's this map. You can access it from anywhere. No matter where you land on the site, you can click around and find out who is uh, your representative. You know, you can you can enter your address and and find out. Uh, we also have this district list here, um, where you can you can you can search and browse, and you can find out like who represents which neighborhood. Uh, you can also you know search like let's say I, li I live in Astoria, so I can type up Astoria and I can find out uh, my council member. Uh, or you can search by their name or however you want. So. We wanted, really wanted to make simple ways for any people to find out how they're represented. Um, okay, so. Awesome. so... We can go back to the slides. Sure. 
Yeah, so that was labs, and the next thing that we really wanted to talk about was participatory budgeting, which you guys heard about this morning. So again, a show of hands, who knows what council district they live in? Awesome. So I know that during the speaker's speech this morning, um, a lot of us were standing in the back, and when she talked about PB and said, go onto the website and check it, I saw a lot of folks um, log on to the regular council website, and it's sort of really hard to find the information on there. So we encourage you guys to go onto labs and find out if you live in a PB district, because you guys could have the opportunity to vote on community projects that are proposed in your neighborhood. And because this is the School of Data Conference, we wanted to get a little bit into the numbers of PB. So last year, in the 2014 to 15 cycle, there were 24 participating council members with over $32 million of the public budget allocated towards community projects. As I said earlier, over 51,000 people voted, 127 neighborhood assemblies were held. These are things within the community where folks can come from all over and propose different projects and learn how to write proposals to be submitted for vote on. Um, over 1,700 ideas were proposed online, with 384 projects ending up on the ballot, and 250 vote sites nationwide. Breaking down those demographics, 63% who voted identified as women, nearly 60% of voters were people of color, with 25% being born outside of the US, approximately 1 in 10 were under the age of 18, and nearly 30% have reported a household income of $25,000 or below. Also, 20% of voters 25 and older had a high school diploma or less. So we can see that the representation from the community engagement portion of PB really engages people that are sort of at the margins or more marginalized by traditional voting processes, which is fairly important. Um, going into our data, we wanted to bring up our colleague, Julia Fredenberg. Uh, so recently, we held our first hackathon here at Civic Hall featuring our constituent services data. And Julia, can you want to say a few words about... So a few weeks ago, we held our first hackathon um, around a data set that the city council has. Um, that's constituent services data. Um, and so kind of how one of the roles of the council is um, in the district serving residents. Um, so you might call your council member if you have problems with your food stamps or pothole or your section eight. Um, and a staff member at the district office would help you, kind of the way like a social worker might help you. Um, and they would keep track of your case um, so that they can keep track of, you know, the 20 cases, the 30 cases that they're working on. And they might keep track of that in um, this database that we have. And it helps them. It's like a tool so that they can keep track of their cases. Um, so just... Last week, um, with the help of Do It, um, we published um, uh, citywide data about this, which you can find uh, on Labs oh, on the website there. Um, and just in case anybody wants to go there right now, it's uh, labs.council.nyc. Um, so we published this data uh, this past week. At the hackathon, we did kind of like a, a preview of the data um, so we could get feedback. You know, how can we make this data better? How can we make it easier for people to use? Um, what are ways that staff um, could be using this data to improve the, the services that they are providing? Um, and how can they, like, um, the end goal is really how can we as the council be providing um, help to residents and improve quality of life? Um, so that's kind of like our, our first aim. Um, but the hackathon was a great opportunity to talk about um, how can we be helping people better and how can we um, make this data more uh, accessible to all people. That was great. So we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions because in putting together this presentation, one of the things we struggled with was, well, especially with the city agencies, people understand the service delivery impact of their work. People understand that DOT fixes the streets, right? That the MTA runs the subways and buses, but the people really don't always have a, book, a good understanding of the work of the city council or of their municipal governments in general, right? These are governments whose job functions might vary city to city, so we all come with a different idea. So we wanted to give you guys a sort of crash course, and we wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so I think we'll, we'll open it up really soon. Yes. I have a yeah. Right. 
So I'll tackle the first one, Andy, I'll kick the second one to you, and then I think I can speak to the third, the could third you, ish question, question as well. Could you repeat the questions? We didn't get them. Sure. sure. So the questions were, um, the first question was, um, what are the goals, the sort of overarching goals that we want to achieve with CouncilStat? Another one was, how do we plan on publicizing this to the public? And the, the very first one, and I think one of the most important ones is, why don't people know who their council member is? Well, why, is why, why is it a problem? Right, so I'll start with, with that one, because I think it sort of goes to the heart of our presentation, which is that government has not always been accessible to the people, right? You know, we understand that people in power benefit from, from aggregating that power. And so I think, you know, the way that government has been in this country is that the most vulnerable populations do not understand how their government functions. And so one of the things that we've been trying to do with labs is to illuminate some of those functions so that people can understand them better. It's one of the reasons we're trying to focus on languages and making sure those, the, the information on the site is available in different languages, um, because I think folks can't be active participants in, in civic engagement when they don't understand what it is they're supposed to give. Right, like what, what their vote means, what their showing up to a PV event means. Does that answer your question? Great. Andy, do you want to talk a little bit about road? Sure. So as far as like how, how, we're, uh, how we're marketing this, um, so we're, we're building this uh, labs, we're building this iteratively. Uh, this is our first step, is this demystification step. And we're hoping to introduce lots of other tools, lots of ways that we can engage with data uh, and like sharing information. Uh, so we... We are, um, we, another, another member of our team, uh, Jasmine Chavez, she is our, our social, social media, uh, she's handling that, and uh, we've, we've been sh sharing labs on social, on social media, and we've already gotten quite a bit of traction, like, uh, like through that we have like thousands of people viewing the MIHCQA page and things like that. Uh, so the, the long-term goal for labs is really to, to eventually replace the council website, and once we're at a point where we can uh, where, where, where we're serving all the same functions that it does, that's, that's when that's going to happen. So um, that's like the, the long-term plan. Yeah, and to add on to different ways that we're getting this out to the public, I think a key moment for us was having our first digital summit last year. Um, this was, like I said, you know, as a former community organizer, um, I often didn't always feel engaged by folks who were doing sort of really innovative technology and, and, digital, and digital strategy work. Um, so convening all those folks in the room, we had over 40 different community groups, lots of whom are grassroots, who have membership bases. Um, come into this room, they are all part of the sort of testing pool that we're sending out labs to, right? So we want to know how labor organizers, how um, just, you know, LGBT folks who live from Jackson Heights to Chelsea are, are thinking through how government impacts them. And we're sort of having those conversations and trying to figure out how to bring that more into the public sphere. So I see one over here, one over here, and then over here. That is a what if. Um, how does somebody who's working on a social good community engagement project that integrates with government data and may actually augment government data, how does that person interface with what you're doing constructively? I mean, I think that's actually a very simple question. It's kind of why we're here. Come talk to us. You know, I think that the creation of our team gives us a, a huge opportunity to kind of just stand here with you all, you know, and, and sort of hash out some of these things that, that haven't really been done before at the council. So, I mean, you can catch us afterwards, but we would, we would love to hear from all of you. I had one back there. Yes, yes, you, in the blue. Hi, are you planning on, I guess, integrating the individual council member pages to labs? Yes, so that's actually something that we've been working on internally. Sure. So we, we, we don't want to just like port things over to where we're just like replicating exactly what the current website does. What we really want to do is uh, we, we, want to, we want to talk to the community and find out what are, what are the needs that they have and, and address those in ways that the old, the old website doesn't. So as I mentioned, like right now, Labs doesn't do all the things that the old website does, but we, you know, we don't just want to do things the same way with like a, a pretty new look. We want, we want to really like change the dynamic of like how it works. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, and one other question. Are, are you also planning to, I guess, integrate this into with, uh, like, I, I guess, Channel 25 here? Or, you know, NYC, TV, whatever. 
Oh, so like me, yeah, like public I, channel I media. Yeah. I think I think that there's definitely an opportunity to incorporate public access content from the different administrations. From, um, but that's something that we're trying to do more intentionally. I think some of the content that Vin's creating and a lot of the content from advocacy groups that are also about demystifying the work of the council, such as from the Center for Urban Pedagogy, are things that we've already integrated into the site, um, but always with a focus right now in, in demystification, you know? And, and going back on, on also what you said earlier about the district pages, something that our team really wanted to do was make it clear that we're building, you know, the council, people call us the people's house, that the voice of the website is the voice of the institution, one that is not necessarily driven by an individual elected official or, or politician, right? And separating that stuff out is something that is very much, uh, you know, on high on our list, it's a high priority for the district pages. We want these district pages to be about the constituents, about the public, right? And, and the council member is the elected official who is, who is mandated by you to, to, to inhabit that role for four years or eight years or whatever. Um, but building out something that can really house that and house those changes um, for, for truer sustainability, so. Um, next. So I guess I'm just curious about the relationship or opportunities for integration with the with the other with the executive branch, with the mayor's office, or other sort of government services. So whether that's the interplay between constituent services data and through in one data, or the um, the sort of count the district map and uh, was it neighborhoods that NYC or some new efforts to sort of like connect people to neighborhood level things, or using three one one as a point of interaction to get people involved with other opportunities for civic engagement rather than just government services. Absolutely. So I think, you know, I'll let Julia jump into this one a little bit because she's been doing a lot of thinking around this with the release of the constituent data, but we've been thinking actively about 311 as a data standard and what it could mean. Um, it's definitely something that, you know, Julia, I'll let you, I'll kick it to you for that. Yeah. Um, I think that there are a lot, a lot of opportunities there and there are a lot of um, ways that the data that we have is similar to 311. Um, I think there are some things that are different. Um, so right now, really, we're just thinking about how can we use these data sets together to get um, a bigger picture of what's happening in the city um, to solve, to kind of see, okay, where are issues occurring? Um, what are people contacting council members about versus what do they contact through and one about? Um, those are really, um, I think, interesting places that we can go with this data. I think one, one struggle that we've had is figuring out what's innovation for innovation's sake versus what's innovation for some of the communities we really want to reach the most. We found that with PB a lot because one of the first things people say to us in the community is, well, why don't you guys just, just put the ballot online? You know, just, you know, like throw all the projects up there and then just have everyone vote and it'll be really easy and it'll make it easier for you because it'll be easier to count the ballots. Um, but because so many communities in New York City have trouble accessing you know, internet at home, we thought that that would actually skew the way the voting happens in different communities, right? So we thought a lot about that this year, which is why we've tried to sort of amp up our texting initiatives by really texting communities in multiple languages and also doing on-site voting with, with you know, tablets, right? And, and sort of amping it up that way. It's a sort of different approach than just throwing it all up into a portal, right? And then meaning that more affluent communities might have access to those decision-making processes. So, yes, over here. Thank you very much. So um, I volunteered a little bit last year for the PB process and it was very interesting. Awesome. I, I went with those um, iPads on the street and uh, <laughs> tried to talk to people and some of them ran away because they, <laughs> they see you approaching with an iPad. and Run away from democracy. <laughs> uh, but uh, in terms of data, so the whole participatory budgeting thing is about changing the process of engagement. So it's not really about data per se. Mm -hmm. And then we have this other side of things of engagement in which we think about digital engagement data. So do you, do you, how do you see, it's a very broad question, but do you, how do you see these two things kind of working together or maybe sometimes not necessarily together? Is there data apart from who are the voters, like apart from demographic data on the voters, but what other kinds of data does the participatory budgeting process in, uh, engender that you, you get that may be useful? Um, so I'm not talking just about putting online the projects that are there, but you know, what kinds of projects, who generates them, um, what is, um, you, you, there could be a bunch of indicators that might be interesting over time 
to see um, how engagement changes. Because once it's not only about letting people know what the councils do, but also sometimes that's not enough. They need to feel like there's a better process for them to get involved than just go online and request a service. But the, they actually have a role in what's happening beyond that. Absolutely. Did everyone hear the question? Okay, so the, the, the question was, you know, because we have a, a former PB volunteer in, in the crowd, um, the question was what, you know, PB is about civic engagement and probably less about data, but is there an opportunity for data taken from PB as well as from other data sets that the council might have um, to create new, to, you know, to look at new analyses that, that we haven't come to already, right? So am I capturing it broadly enough? Uh, so I don't, I don't know if either of you guys have things to add to that. I, I can start off. Um, so I think when we look at the different types of data that the council collects, there's our, our finance data. So the actual data from the fiscal budget of the city every year. So what gets funded? This is the actual sort of bits and stuff about like after school programs or how much money each senior center gets for lunches and staff hours, right? Um, and then there's the capital budget that funds um, sort of I guess we define it as like things you can kick, so like your park benches and playground blacktops um, and, and light posts and things like that, right? Um, these are all things that are part of the city budget. That's data that, that we have and that we're working on making more and more accessible. Um, right now, a lot of it lives in PDFs, um, but, but it's, we, there's a lot of, in, of, of internal work to, to make sure that that's more usable to the public. We have our constituent services data, which is data all about service delivery, and often it means, um, going back to a previous question, connecting folks to 311 service, right? So there's sort of a, a bridge here that can maybe be d refined in a way and, and made more useful. Um, there's PB data, which actually, already we've seen in the cycles that have happened, can be indicators of, of things that budget may have missed as a result of anything, you know? So if 15 people in a community near Fort Greene Park are requesting a project that has to do with, with resurfacing a basketball court because children are being injured, that might not necessarily need to be a PB project, right? During New York City Big Apps, one of the conversations we were having was how we could channel that data into alerting the agencies of larger community issues that might be of merit for them to look at, right? So that's definitely one way of thinking about it, just crosswalking sort of these like big indicators over to other agencies to help but more effectively and more efficiently solve problems for New Yorkers. So does that answer your question? Over here, oh wait, over here, over here, and then over here. So, okay, I, I say this as a highly educated PB first, you know, Gales district, first round, et cetera. And I love what you guys did here in July, I was there. Um, and I'd love to talk to you more afterwards, but I have two very concrete questions. So one is, I've gone to the lab site, I really like it, and I wanna know, what the timeline is or what the plan is regarding individual city council members' pages. And the example I'll give is Ben Kalos, who's gonna be here later this afternoon, has benkalos.com, basically his own site, because the city council one is so limited, and when I was looking at his site in anticipation of hearing him today, it said, you know, click on this for our digital, you know, award ceremony, and it was a broken link. And it said, you know, click here to sign up for our newsletter. And it didn't work. And, and I'm not trying to single him out, but like, I know the city council, like I've talked to people who are there, like, and the council members go around it by making their own. So the question is, do you plan to work directly with council members? And hopefully I would say in a democratic yet definitive way, like make people, give them the tools so they can use the main site because they don't use the site. So that's like the first question. And the second question is, I understand what you're saying about trying to connect people better with 311, et cetera. Um, I don't know if you heard me ask the question before about um, the private uh, sanitation workers. I mean, not sanitation, private haulers or, okay, then I, forget it, it was part of the lunch thing, but, uh, Unfortunately, I feel like so much of 311's job and others are basically like, I don't want to make it sound negative, but like passing the buck. And you can now text 311, you can call 311, you can do whatever, you know, everyone knows that. But the actual like reply 
that if, like I've never gotten a reply back from a 311 complaint and I've been told to call them for a variety of things. So I was wondering if you were at all working with the 311, let's say agency or whatever you want to call it. I don't know what it technically falls under, do it or some other, you know, entity to make, to help people connect more directly because it would help even during things like Sandy. Like if somebody could, you know, like tweet out, I lost my power and someone else could tweet out like a block away, I have it, you know, to basically help. Cause I feel like 311, unfortunately, people frequently say in government, oh, you know, they'll redirect you, et cetera. But that's just taking your question and putting it in like a huge pool and hoping that like a dolphin will pop out. Absolutely. Did everyone hear that question? Or those two questions? So I, I can start with the first question. Yeah, totally. So the first question is, uh, is basically what are we doing about member pages on labs? So, so right now, yeah, you, you've been to it. You've, you've seen that, you know, that we have very basic information. Like if I go to my council member's page, you can find out uh, the, the, the date they were elected uh, and the, the committees that they sit on. Um, you can find out how to contact them, and that's about it. Um, and you mentioned that on our current old site, uh, various council members are using their pages in different ways. Uh, they're they're having like their own websites because they can't use the, the city website in the way that they want to. So um, uh, I mentioned before that we're building labs iteratively. So our next our next goal with it is actually to to start introducing. Uh, better features into the member pages. So we're actually in the process of doing a bit of research with the, with the members, with their offices, and with, and with like people to find out like what it is that, that, uh, that would make a great member page. And we want to start introducing features into those member pages so that like, that is like the source where people will find information about their district. So that's up next. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, we, we don't have like a, a set time frame for that, but like, it's, it's next. I, I can't say. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's okay. Um, for for three one one. Yes. I mean, I first wanted to say that. I mean, having you know, being an, a team in an office that's constantly in this space, I do think there's a lot of motivation and commitment at NYC three one one to be not only at Civic Hall but be engaging with the community and talk. You know, think about ways that they can be more efficient, be answering requests better, and also capturing that data and making it available to the public. And I think that there's probably some folks here today from NYC 311 or from any of the mayoral agencies. So I would definitely encourage you to, to go talk to them. I know that we are, right, so I mean, but, but we are definitely in conversation with them about different ways that we can connect our work. Because I do think that most constituents, most New Yorkers, when they have an issue, they go to the place where they know they're gonna get an answer, either the quickest or the best kind of answer, right? Sometimes that's the number that you see plastered in the subways. Sometimes that's your local council member who you know because you met that person outside of the subway or you've attended an event with them before. And sometimes that's an advocacy organization, right? If you're, say if you're an undocumented immigrant, there might be some advocacy organizations that you trust far greater than, than you know, something that you don't understand, right? And so I think it's really about about taking that constellation of, of entities and, and trying to make sure that they all talk to each other in a way that's efficient. So, does that answer your question, Jacqueline? Okay, cool. <laughs> we had one over here and then one back there. Um, in terms of user interface with the website, I was wondering if you had any specific interactive strategies that you're trying to work with, like in terms of connecting just people that aren't as tech savvy to the information, just if you're working on any interactive strategies. Um, sh sure, so like uh, I'll, I can start by saying like the, the, the Council Labs is like fully responsive. It'll work as, as well on a mobile device as it will on a desktop or tablet, whatever. Um, and we're, we're trying to be like super aware of accessibility issues. Uh, and so like, like from the ground up, we're building this to be as accessible as possible. So that's, does that answer your question? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, you have one strategy, which is the mapping. And I didn't know, that's really cool that people can, you know, go with the mouse over it and, oh, there's my district, there's a uh -huh. pop-up of the person that's part of your district. I didn't know if there was going to be other aspects of, like, multimedia storytelling. I didn't, I, maybe you're not there yet, because, again, you're at one level of it, but I just didn't know if you had discussed that. I'm just wondering other strategies about that. Yeah, we're definitely in conversation about what kinds of multimedia and what kinds of stories we want to tell. I think, 
I think storytelling as a legislative body um, has to be really, really intentional, right? Um, because, well, I don't need to say much more about that, but, but I, I do think it's really important to, to think about what we should say, what we, what we want to make more available to the public, and try to create sort of more riveting, riveting storytelling around that, right? It's something that we're definitely exploring. Vincent has been thinking a lot about that, um, just about the sort of standards for the different communication that we have across the board um, and how we sort of bring that into the, into the 21st century in a way. Um, I think communication channels are probably something we've been working a little more on. I think SMS is a conversation that we started to really have throughout the council. Obviously, I've mentioned it a million times, we use it in PB to let people know that they can text in and find out where to vote, right? But we've also started to find that different communities use texting in different ways. So I had an assumption going in that seniors, for instance, like you shouldn't text them because they haven't learned how to text, right? Um, but what I noticed when we've you know, gone to do events at senior centers or stuff like that is that a lot of folks in these centers are really adept at getting texts and deciphering the information in them. So if I text my grandma and I tell her these like 80 things I'm doing, she'll probably read it, um, even if she doesn't really understand how to respond, right? Um, and I think that's something that we hadn't, that we had to see by being on the ground, right? We had to see by having those conversations with advocates. And so I think we're, we're probably a little further along with that kind of exploration um, in terms of thinking through, okay, what are, what are new ways of communicating with people? And what are the presumptions that we all bring? You know, as a millennial, what are the presumptions that, that we bring to that, to that process? So, yeah. back there, I think. And then, oh, and you, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious about like um, how you're thinking about the um, sort of target users of the site, essentially. And it, um, in addition to individuals, are you thinking at all about how you're engaging advocacy organizations and sort of um, what that audience set looks like or what plans may be there? Yeah. Start off. I can jump in too. Yeah. So. I, I I think that's that's probably really important when we start adding features for you know like for for like for the budget section and things like that. Uh, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be important to to focus on users at different levels, like not just the, our individual, our, not just our neighbors, but also like the organizations that that need access to the to a different kind of information. But so that's definitely something we're considering. Yeah. But I think it's also about you know taking the public temperature. I think sometimes. Just as with the member pages, when there are workarounds to the information you're putting out, it's often a good indicator that you should at least look at that, how that information is being put out. Um, member pages is one example, and I think um, in, in sort of the recent history of our work, we've seen a lot of work around legislative databases, right, and the way that people gain access to our legislative data. Um, David Moore is here from, from Cancelmatic. He's someone that we're in contact with. He's done amazing work to sort of streamline um, the, the interface to our Legistar, right? Um, and we're you know, prepping for the, the release of an API. But um, that's, I think, something that is really big for, for organizations. I think when I was an organizer, it was really hard to find out where the hearing was, where I was supposed to testify, where I could give my testimony to people so that the testimony would be public, right? Um, and so I think that's something that, a conversation that we really, really want to have with advocacy organizations. You know, there's, there's a budget piece and then there's really the legislation piece, right? The, the policy piece, so, yeah. Sorry, I know we like, I skipped over you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering if there are plans, or if it already exists on the website, a feature to gain constituent feedback. Like if you show um, whether it's particip participatory budgeting or a bill, whether where people could say, you know, I either as one person I approve of this or don't approve of it, or they could comment on it. Yeah, I mean, so that's a feature that that we've started to look into. I think it's hard because I also. One of the things that we talked about is not creating a, a new black box for people to, to put feedback in and, and not be able to give people some kind of receipt or, or you know, confirmation that their, that their feedback went somewhere. I think where people really do um, 
get at us is, is on Twitter, right, and on social media. So, so we've really tried to, to amp up the social media capacity around our hearings. A lot of the council members are really enthusiastic. They'll, they'll often now take questions from Twitter or from Facebook during the hearings. So it's not just about the sort of brick and mortar confines of the room where the hearing is being held. Uh, but obviously only, you know, there are only certain types of people on Twitter or Facebook. And so I think we're, we're trying to figure out what the best medium is without sort of just building a new box um, to direct people to that, that might not be intuitive for them, you know, had we not created it, right? Um, but I do, but we're definitely looking into that. Yeah. We can probably take one more question and then uh, come talk to us after. But yeah, yeah so in the back. Oh, thank you. I, I'm from Italy okay. and um, I work both for a government organization and for a civil society initiative. And um, building on the previous questions about the budget data and the feedback, uh, we, we are trying to uh, link the two things and publish the data on the budget. So very detailed data about projects, infrastructures, and uh, city services uh, to, uh, and publish them in a way that we can collect feedback on each of the single detailed items of the budget. And, and, and people like my organization uh, are doing ca uh, kind of uh, campaigns and monitoring campaigns in which people are engaged in uh, doing some systematic monitoring of what is going on and report the feedback to the administrations. So I, I don't know if that could be feasible or something interesting for, for the city council. I mean, I definitely think it could be. You should, we should talk afterwards. It sounds like you, you got, you're working on something really cool. So. I think there's one more question back there. Can we, one back more, here. I think we have one last question back there. Uh, thanks for making time. Um, so uh, to paraphrase uh, Ms. Brewer, um, people are primarily interested in what's immediately local to them. So given that you have uh, this panoply of data and, and interest to kind of represent in this website, do you have any ideas for features that would help to kind of target just track only the issues that I subscribe to and then either deliver that like via digest or in some sort of like a more push notification process rather than me continuing to have to go back and sort and sift through the whole pile? Yeah, definitely. We're definitely exploring ways that we can like disseminate information to get things out to people through whether it's through text messages or uh, signing, signing up through email to like finding out uh, information about specific issues that you're interested in um, or like council in general or like uh, really to the level that you want. We'd love to be able to like fine tune that. Uh, but we're also interested in finding out uh, ideas from all of you as to as to like what that should be. Uh, if you go into labs, you can find a way to, to contact us uh, at uh, th like through email and we would love to hear your ideas too. So if you have ideas for how that could best work for you, let us know. Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys for a little crash course at the City Council. We welcome your questions and your thoughts. Have a good one. Thank you.